podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, May 14th, and the Developmental Disabilities Administration welcomes you to the DDA Educational Series webinars. Today's topic is how to report abuse and neglect. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. This webinar is open to all stakeholders and will be recorded and put on the DDA website. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webinar, by computer and by phone, and if you have trouble hearing, you may try switching modes by clicking on the appropriate button on the webinar panel in the audio section. There are handouts for this webinar, which you can find in the handout section. If you're listening in by phone and would like them emailed, you can email me, Donna Will, at donna.will at maryland.gov to receive them. We will be recording today's webinar, and if you send me an email, I can also send you a link to the webinar. And we will be putting this uh, educational series uh, on the website, and uh, all sessions will be posted soon. Questions can be typed in the question box, which is in the webinar panel, and they will be read and answered aloud as long as they relate to today's topic. So we have several staff uh, presenting today. Um, Angela Clark, who is the Director of Quality Enhancement, and also um, we have Adrian Holloman, who is the Director of Nursing, who um, I would like to introduce right now. So um, hello, Adrian. Hi, Donna. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So as we're introducing this um, webinar, we're going to go over the agenda. Um, we will be talking today about how to report abuse and neglect. We will start with an overview of the DDA, and next we will talk about the why, followed by information regarding the policy on reportable events and investigations, which we call PORI, um, abuse, neglect, and incident reporting, after which we will cover the resources and end the webinar with the question and answers um, from the webinar participants. So the DDA believes that all people have the right to live, love, work, learn, play, and pursue their life aspirations in the community. We partner with people with developmental disabilities and families to provide support and resources to live fulfilling lives. We provide a coordinated service delivery system to enable children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and families to work towards self-determination, interdependence, productivity, integration, and inclusion in all facets of community life across their lifespans. We are one of many resources available, services and supports available to assist individuals and families as they build their lives toward their vision of the good life. The DDA supports children and adults with developmental disabilities and their families. Before considering the various services and supports available under the DDA waiver programs, it is essential to first consider the goals to support the person's vision of what is a good life. The DDA has four regional offices which are located across the state. This slide displays that information regarding the offices, including the director, the county served, and their contact phone numbers. So our why. Why are we discussing how to report abuse and neglect? Well, we desire to protect the rights of individuals with developmental disabilities, community agencies that are licensed by the DDA, our state residential centers, our forensic residential centers that are also operated by the DDA, and our support brokers are required to identify, report, investigate, review, correct, and monitor situations and events that threaten the health, safety, or well-being of our participants um, receiving services. The purpose of these activities is to protect individuals from harm and enhance the quality of our services that we are providing to them. 
To ensure the health, safety, and well-being of the people receiving services, the DDA developed the policy and follows the policy on reportable events and investigations, also known as PORI. The PORI ensures the health, safety, and welfare of our participants who are receiving services from DDA licensed um, and DDA funded providers by formalizing a process which identifies, report, and resolve manners or incidents in a timely manner. So what type of incidents do we report? What type of issues should be reported? We should be reporting abuse, neglect, hospital admissions, emergency room visits, injuries, medication errors, choking, any interactions which it requires the um, assistance of law enforcement, fire department, emergency medical services, theft or theft of individuals' properties or funds, exploitation, unexpected or risky absences, restraints, and death. Now we'll talk more specifically about abuse and neglect. So the abuse, our definition would be abuse is the willful infliction of injury, unreasonable confinement, intimidation, or punishment, which, resulting, which results in physical harm, pain, or mental anguish. The DDA divides abuse into three subcategories, physical, psychological, and sexual. Physical abuse would be defined as physical contact, which may include, but is not limited to hitting, slapping, pinching, kicking, biting, strangling, pushing, shoving, or otherwise mishandling an individual. Physical contact that is not necessary for the safety of the individual and causes discomfort to the individual, or the handling of an individual with more force than is reasonably necessary would also be considered physical abuse. Psychological abuse, um, also referred to as emotional or mental abuse, is sustained and repetitive form of mistreatment to cause mental or emotional anguish by threat, intimidation, humiliation, isolation, or other verbal or nonverbal conduct in order to systematically diminish someone else. It can include bullying, rejecting, degrading, terrorizing, isolating, corrupting, exploiting, and denying emotional responsiveness. It includes verbal abuse, such as yelling, name calling, blaming, and shaming. Abusive statements are intended to humiliate or infantilize and include insults, threats of abandonment or institutionalization, and other controlling, dominant, or jealous behavior. The third form is sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is when sexual acts that are performed for the purpose of arousing sexual thoughts or feelings or sexual dominance or power and not for purposes related to the provision of care. It can also include physical or non-physical contacts. Our neglect or neglect definition is the failure to provide proper care and attention to an individual that results in significant harm or jeopardy of harm to the individual's health, safety, or well-being. Failure to provide necessities such as food, clothing, essential medical treatment, adequate supervision, shelter, or safe environment. At this point, I'll turn over the presentation to Angela to, to go over the get rest of the incident reporting. Thank you, Adrian. Now we will talk a little bit about the reporting process. As a reminder, if you see something, say something. You may be wondering, who should report an alleged incident? Well, a number of people can report incidents, including mandated reporters, who are all professionals, including health practitioners, police officers, educators, and human service workers. 
who have reason to believe that abuse or neglect of a child or a vulnerable adult has taken place. Reporters also include family members, neighbors, and the community at large. Now you may be wondering, what are reportable incidents? Reportable incidents are significant events or situations that because of the severity or the sensitivity of the situation must be reported. The DDA requires its providers to submit incidents electronically within prescribed timeframes to the Office of Healthcare Quality, the local DDA regional office, the involved coordinator of community services office, the family, advocates, Disability Rights Maryland, social services, law enforcement, or other external entities as directed by individual policies. So how and where should incidents of abuse or neglect be reported? To the Office of Healthcare Quality, or the DDA via the website that you're able to see on our screen, to one of DDA's regional offices, to your family members, coordinator of community services, to DDA constituent services, or if you are a DDA provider or DDA staff, directly into our provider consumer information system. Let's talk through four reporting processes to see what steps are taken when someone reports an incident of abuse or neglect. We'll look at reporting through con constituent services, reporting using the DDA website, reporting via contacting the local regional DDA office, and through your CCS or provider. Now at times, you may report the incident to constituent services. When someone contacts constituent services, our constituent services coordinator, Anthony, will collect some preliminary information and contact the DDA regional office to inquire or notify the regional quality enhancement director of the alleged incident. Based on the information gathered from the regional QE director, Anthony will contact the submitter and provide them with next steps and provide the submitter with the contact information of the regional QE director handling the allegation. Another scenario would be if you wanted to report the incident via the DDA website. And as you can see on the DDA homepage from the screen, if in the far right hand corner, there is four rectangles and one says report abuse or concern. Once you click on report abuse or concern, the report incident screen will pop up. And on the right side of the page, under popular links is how do I? which instructs the submitter to contact the Office of Healthcare Quality. And you'll just click on the link to file the complaint. People also have the option of contacting one of DDA's four regional offices to report an incident directly to the Director of Quality Enhancement. Once the Regional Director of Quality Enhancement collects the information from the reporter, that director will instruct, excuse me, that instructor will see if that incident report form has been reported to DDA through our provider consumer information system and contact the provider agency to inquire regarding the incident. If the incident has not been reported, the Director of Quality Enhancement instructs the provider to enter the incident in PCIS for further investigation and retention purposes. The regional QE director will also track the incident throughout the investigation. They will research trends associated with this incident. They will provide technical assistance to the provider if requested, 
in addition to submitting and communicating with the Office of Healthcare Quality regarding the incident. They will also track the provider agency's action plans to ensure compliance. As previously stated, the incident reporting information is entered into our PCIS system. And on this slide, you can see a couple of the screens from the online incident reporting form. Some of the information we collect includes the number of people involved, the person's involved information, the agency information, the agency's contact information, the type of incident, the circumstances of the incident, the status of the person at the time of the report, the agency's immediate response. It'll also ask questions like, does the person have a behavior plan? Who was witnessed the incident? Was staff on duty? And other relevant information. Now the last reporting process we'll cover today is incident reporting via the coordinator of community services or provider agency. Once a person contacts the CCS or provider agency, that agency is required to report the alleged incident to DDA via our PCIS system and internally investigate the allegation to ensure the safety and well-being of their client. Once the incident is reported, the Office of Healthcare Quality and the Medicaid Fraud Unit are notified of the alleged incident for investigated excuse me, purposes as well. Based on the results of the internal investigation, if substantiated, the provider agency will develop an action plan and complete it. As previously stated, the Regional Quality Enhancement Director will also track the incident throughout the investigation, research trends associated with the incident, provide technical assistance to the provider if requested, submit and communicate with OHCQ regarding the incident, and track that provider agency's action plan to ensure compliance. Well, that finishes our presentation on how to report abuse and neglect. We will now review a couple of resources. First, we have the contact information for the Developmental Disabilities Administration, the Office of Healthcare Quality, and of course, Anthony, our Constituent Services Coordinator. Now, if you decide to contact the region directly to report an incident, you will want to direct your call to one of the following regional directors of quality enhancement or their team. In the central region, we have Shireen Hodge Ryan. In the eastern region, we have Adedapo Latitan. In the southern region, we have Mark Celeste. And in the western region, we have Don Orndoff. There are two remaining educational webinars scheduled in the month of May. The next webinar will be on Tuesday, March the 21st, May the 21st, my apologies, and the presentation will be on the role of coordinators of community services. And on Tuesday, May the 28th, there will be a presentation on understanding appeals and reconsideration. At this time, Adrian and I would like to thank you all for joining us, and we'll now turn the presentation back over to you, Donna. Are you ready for questions? Yes. Yeah. All right, so now we will start addressing questions in the queue. If you have a question and would like to ask one of our subject matter experts, Adrian or myself, a question regarding how to report abuse or neglect, please type your question into the chat box and one of us will respond. And I'm just going to take a quick peek and see if we have any questions today. Can I read them to you? <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, let's open it up and see if we can see them, and then we can read them out loud. So let's make this a little bit bigger. I only see one question. Okay. Okay. So, so go ahead and read it for us. Okay, licensed nurses are mandated reporters of suspected abuse neglect. They are trained to report to Adult Protective Service and Child Protective Service. It is my understanding that there is a MOU with the APS and CPS that all complaints are deferred to DDA. So to whom should the RN LPN nurse report? If to DDA, and since the licensed nurse does not have access to PCIS2, should they report via the tab on the DDA website? They can give a call to the regional office or to the Office of Healthcare Quality. Okay. Um, so usually what we have is, is that if the nurse um, is an employer of an agency, uh, we then uh, make sure that, that agency reports. And so if that agent, if that nurse is not hired by that agency, uh, they do have two options to report it to the leads that um, Angela share on the screen from the regional offices to uh, file a formal complaint or a report. And then we will then guide it and complete the information in our PCIS2 system. Um, if for some reason, you are not able to uh, get in touch or reach out to the regional office, you can always go to that slide where Angela showed you that you can report directly to the Office of Healthcare Quality and then complete the form accordingly. Thank you so much for your question. We currently have no questions in the queue. Oh, no, if you have we've got a whole bunch. They just all mm -hmm. piled in there all at once. <laughs> All right, Don, if you don't mind reading them, I can't see them. Sure. Um, what's the timeline for reporting incidents? The timeline for reporting an incident is going to vary based upon the type of incident. But for most incidents, as soon as you're aware of it, it should be reported within 24 hours. And there's a second question, same thing. Um, what are the time frames with reporting? I think that what we need to do is refer everybody to the PORI uh, policy and procedures that guides and tells people exactly what it is. Uh, for example, we want people to report as soon as possible. There's some things we want to report within 24 hours. And there's some, and then the other piece is how long does it take to do the internal investigation or the external investigation. But any incident report should be reported immediately. And while we know that agencies are families and everybody's trying to get all the facts, we really want all the incidents to be reported within 24 hours. Okay, we have another really question. Um, who would be the proper reporter of alleged abuse neglect to a self-directed participant? So it can be whoever observes the, or whoever suspects. So if it's a support broker, if it's the individual or the participant, if it's a family body, family person, it's anyone who suspects. And what we try to tell people is if you assume, you suspect, you think, you know, it's better to report it. And then when the investigation gets completed, it could be substantiated or not substantiated, but we don't want neighbors or friends or families to become expert reporters or investigators. We just want to be aware of the incident so that we can um, uh, take the proper action accordingly. Again, thank you for your question. Okay. Um, have the revisions on PORI been finalized? They have not been finalized. Uh, we're in the process of reviewing and they will go out for public comment shortly. And then they will be finalized after the public comment and revisions. Okay, there's a question I'm not sure. Um, having trouble understanding it myself, but um, I 
I'm so to... you don't need to really understand the question. We just want you just to read them like they are shown on the screen. Okay. Upon reviewing, this is um, asked in three, three question boxes. Okay. Upon reviewing PCIS2 incident reports submitted by provider, the question guardian contacted or has guardian is checked as no guardian and the CCS knows there is a guardian. How does that information get updated in PCIS? So read it one more time, Donna. I'm sorry. See, <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> um, I think the question is about how 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 does information get updated in PCIS um, when the so, CCS is involved and guardians involved. Um, if if it's there? not if it has not been updated, if there is a guardian um, and it's not been updated in PCIS too, that generally goes to the regional office who um, submits all demographic changes and information changes in the system in the PCIS. Um, we will still be reporting in PCIS2 after LTSS goes final in 2020? Yes, the, it will be a pro, uh, process. So right now in 2020, we'll still be in PCIS2. Okay. Are police brought into situations where an incident has been reported? It depends on what the incident is. If it, if it should be um, reported to the police or police should have police involvement, it will be reported. Okay. If an individual was in a car accident and the individual was not injured but visited the ER and not admitted, is this considered an incident even though the person was not injured? Should it be reported? Yes. Any type of encounter where one of our clients are involved, we need to have that reported, just so we can have it on the record. I think that was the last question. Yeah. And um, yeah, if I hope we answered that one person's question. Um, if not, um, please submit your question again if you feel like it was not answered. Okay, I see a wait. Susan, we're waiting for you whenever you're ready. We have another question. When the police are involved in an, in an incident, should we get a report number? Yes. If it's available. Yes, if it's available. And later on um, during the investigation so, process. So usually when there's a police involved, um, they usually give you their name and there's an ID number for the police officer. And we want people to be able to give the name and the ID number of that tag for that police officer so that we can then go back and get the actual incident report because they'll do a different reporting. Um, so there's a couple of things that take place when the police is involved or adult protective services involved or child protective services involved. If the police is involved or any other entities that I just mentioned are involved, they take the lead in the investigation and the DDA or the OHCQ pulls back uh, because they then become the lead of the investigation and we are not able to do anything else until we get the findings. So that's why it's really important that we get the name and the badge number of that officer. Great question. And so the next one is when there is a uh, discrepancy between agency uh, internally investigated versus reportable incidents um, in PCIS2. Um, so if there's any discrepancies in any of what's being reported and what's in the NCIS2, we want you to reach out to your regional office, the QE person, and then we can look to make sure that that information is clear and concise because we want to make sure that everything that is put into the system and what is happening um, and matches um, and if we need to get additional information or, or additional uh, testi um, testimonies or or information from the staff of the uh, of the witnesses, we want to make sure that that's accurate and appropriate. Um, if a person uh, goes to the ER and um, and out with four hours 
a report needs to be made, i.e. Um, yes, if they go to the ER. Yep. Okay, I'm just going through it down to see if there's any more. I think we got, uh, they're kind of popping in a little slow here on this end, Donna. I don't know if they're popping in that slow on your end. Yeah. I don't see any new questions. Okay. So if there is no new questions, I, I would recommend that folks really look at the DDA website, uh, familiarize yourself with where to, how to, and what to, where to report to. Um, this summer, our Director of Nursing and Angela will be sharing with the public where we are with the additions and the enhancements to our um, PORI. And so we'll be sharing that. I know that was a question asked, so we'll try to have that out this summer, for, this summer to get people's um, input and recommendation. But for today's purpose, we really wanted to make sure that um, folks, families, people in services know where and how to report an incident. Um, or if they feel they're being abused, neglected, exploited, any of those areas, we just want you to be aware that there is a place for you to report um, if you want to do it anonymously, if you want to talk directly to a region, if you want to do it um, through it, the um, internet, through a web-based um, process, those things are available for you. And we just didn't know how many people knew about um, how to report in the avenues people had to ensure the health and safety. So if that is it and there's no more questions, uh, please join us again next Tuesday where we're going to be talking about um, case conflict resolutions and um, Amy will be joining in within that discussion. Is it that? Oh, the Jumanji is next week, right? Uh, Dr. Smalls on the roles and of, yes, it's good. Yeah. Thank you for correcting that. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I hope you have a great rest of the day. <laughs>